Well, I don't know about you, but I, I feel like we touched a little bit of heaven right there. I feel like heaven came and invaded our space. Thank you. Well, I'm pausing, not for effect. <laughs> I'm pausing just to see where he wants me to go. Many are the plans and ideas of man, right? <laughs> well, I welcome you here today. I know I already welcomed some of you, but I'm excited for what God's doing. I'm excited. For what he has in store for us today. How many of you came today prepared not to just hear a word, but to receive the word and then do something with that word? All right, awesome. I'm going to get you in a hand raising mood here today. We know that's not typically our, our norm uh, here at Resurrection Life Church. Uh, we, don't, we don't like to raise hands when the pastor asks us a question. But we're going we're gonna to fight for it today. I welcome anybody that's online today. I was thinking about all of our our shut-ins, the ones that I could that could come to mind, and there's there's some of our shut-ins and people that have uh, went through some things, not just because of COVID, but just in, in their life and the health, of the uh, battles that they're in. And there's some that literally have not been in church for close to two years, not because they don't want to be here, but because they they can't get here. And uh, I pray that the same uh, spirit that is here, the same presence that is felt here in this uh, sanctuary, will be felt through the airways as they're watching online. And that God would minister to them just as he's going to minister to us. Um, I'm, I'm only going to read from two passages of scripture today. But I got a question. Not, not a spiritual question. It's just one of those weird things that helped me transition. And uh, I won't give you all the details uh, as to why I'm going to ask this question. But hopefully by the end of the message, you'll be able to kind of see maybe what was going through my mind this week as I was preparing uh, the message. But... Um, how many of you prefer salty snacks over sweet? Salty, so raise your hand. Sweets, raise your hand. Oh, wow, we've got a bunch of sweet tooths in the, in the crowd today. How many of you like both? Right, okay, there we go, all right. <laughs> that may have been the greatest crowd participation that Resurrection Life Church has ever had. We just need to close the doors of church right now. No, just kidding. Um, Jenny and I had this conversation a lot, uh, sweet and salty, and we go back and forth, and um, I, I like all of it. Sometimes I like the combination of things, and uh, I like the sweet and the salty, and I go back and forth, but um, this, this week we, we had a couple different things uh, going on, and uh, we, we was at a track meet, and I had some of the saltiest popcorn I've ever had in my entire, and I didn't put any salt on it. Anybody ever had that, 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 that popcorn that's so salty that like instantly your mouth like dries up and you almost like pucker because it's so salty? But I don't know where you're at in that, but like all of a sudden like I'm addicted to that taste. You know, and I do have a, a little bit of an addictive personality, so I may be a, a rare person here. But next thing I knew, I was like licking the bottom of, of the paper bag, you know, trying to get all this popcorn. And I'd already went through a, a whole drink, but I was still like trying to get to the saltiness of it. And ah, I just poured it in there. And then I couldn't figure out why I was so thirsty the, the rest of the night. And it was just one of those things that happened. And uh, I, I, it was one of those things that God begins to trigger things in my mind. My mind works a little bit different sometimes, and I was thinking about it. And then uh, the other day, I think it was yesterday, actually, uh, we were out doing some things, and, and we stopped and, and got some Wendy's for lunch in the drive-thru. I, I kept watching my daughter, like, like, take her hand outside the window and, like, doing this. I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, these fries are so salty. I can't stand it when I get salt on my hands. And I'm like, I don't shake it. I just, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, come on. You know, I don't wipe chocolate off of my fingers. I lick it off. You know, I have, I have, uh, I was raised in a barn. I know, I understand. But I was thinking about those things, and 
Uh, I was thinking about, God, where am I, what are you doing in my mind with all this stuff, and how does it relate to church, and how, does it, how am I going to do anything with this? And it's just, this just some stuff that went through my mind, and I begin to think, you know, because so, so many times what we do is we'll build up to, uh, last week was, it was Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, and we build up to that, and we get all excited, and, and, and we know that God's doing things, and we're reflecting on what he's done, and so many times, even like Christmas, they, they say that even after Christmas that there's, there's depression that sets in heavily because people build up so much for it and are looking forward to it so much. Uh, if you're like my, my grandma, she used to literally save all year long for Christmas and buy all year long only to pay off what she spent last year, right? And uh, it was a big deal for her, and, and I was spoiled in that, in that aspect. But so many times we do that, and I was thinking about this week, and I'm like, yes, we celebrated the resurrection of Christ, and we're worshiping God for everything that he's done in our life and that we've, uh, that we've received him. But I was thinking about the disciples. You know, what, what were they doing? Because we, we pick on the disciples a lot. We pick on them because, you know, we're like, well, he told you, like I said last week, I was like, he told you multiple times that he was going to die, that he was going to be persecuted, and he was going to be put in the ground, but three days later, he was going to raise, and here you are, woo- woo-hooing and boo-hooing, and because he was in the tomb, and he was crucified, and things didn't work out the way you thought, but he told you this was going to happen, and it's easy for us to sit there and, and, and uh, cast blame at him and point fingers at him, but so many times like us, Even though you know what God has spoken to you, even though you feel like what God has called you to, when it begins to show up different than the way you interpreted what God said to you, all of a sudden it doesn't make sense. How many of you have, don't raise your hands because I don't want to, I don't want to not live up to that expectation that we already set today, but you know, think about this. How many times have you walked through something in your life where you knew God was opening doors and directing you in certain ways, but as you were in that journey and on that path, it didn't quite work out the way that you thought. And all of a sudden, you start begin to doubt God and begin to question whether or not you really believed, and you begin to question, well, did I really hear what he said? Am I, was I trusting what he said, or is that just was I getting in the way? And we go through some of those things, and sometimes... What happens with these disciples is, is they were so set in, in their ideas of things that when it didn't work out the way they thought, it messed them up a little bit. Even, even though he came to them last week on Resurrection Sunday and he, t- he, t- he, he revealed himself to a few of them and said, look, we're going to meet in Galilee. Go ahead. I'm going to be there. I'm gonna, I, I've prepared the way. And even though we think about that and they're like, yes. They're excited. Our Savior isn't really dead. Our Messiah is alive. We've seen him. We've touched him. He's revealed himself to us. Now must be the real plan that he was coming for. Remember, because the whole time they thought that the Messiah was coming to bring the kingdom, which they thought was an earthly kingdom. They thought the Jewish people were finally going to be raised back up and they were going to finally thump on the Romans a little bit and finally take their place and be that world power that they they knew God's chosen people were supposed to be. Just for a second there, I've got to take a, a, a minute and give a little testimony. Uh, as I sat down, I was released last week, or I was released this week to actually start walking on my, my foot again, which is cool for me because when I started this whole process, they told me that I would be non-weight bearing for up to 12 weeks and then I'd be in a boot for up to six months. And mentally that starts weighing on you and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to miss camp. I've got to walk through camp in a boot. On vacation, I'm going to have sand all up in there from trying to walk on the beach. I'm not going to be able to get in the ocean. And all these things are going through my mind. And uh, last week, they actually released me to start putting some pressure on it. Uh, We did the baptism up here, and everybody, I felt super uncomfortable last week. I had multiple people trying to help me and get everywhere. And I was fighting my own humanity, like, just let me be a man. Whether I fall or not, just let me fall. Uh, But I was fighting through some of those things, and I appreciated what everybody did. and, And... I'm saying all that to say that I know that God had started a work in, in my ankles and in this process. Even though I had to walk through surgery, I know God started that process because uh, Tuesday he released me to, to be 100% on my, on my feet without the scooter, without a crutch. And he, he, he told me that, that within a month he expects me to be walking in my, with my own shoes. And so to be in that process, and that would only be the 12-week process. So literally half the time, I know that God started something, and sometimes we just have to walk through those things that are uncomfortable, that don't look 
like God has answered or showed up for us. But when, he, when we do, all of a sudden we begin to see what he's doing and working in us. And I know that many of, many of you have been praying for me, and I do appreciate that. But I was thinking about these disciples, and as they were going through this thing, Jesus had already told them, look, I've got to, I'm going to have to die. I'll be raised to life. But think about this. He had been telling them for three and a half years of some of the things he was expecting them to do. Just like many of us, we may get saved and we may accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but then we, we kind of wander around like, well, what's next? We know that, that eternity is secured for us. We know that heaven is, is secured for us, but what do we do in the meantime? And I'm looking at these things, and if you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, in one, of, in one of Jesus' sermons, he goes through the Beatitudes and he's listing all these things, and, and he shifts gears here in Matthew chapter 5. And I've taught out of this multiple times, uh, even to the youth and uh, to the adults. I think in the adult congregation, I think this is about the third time that I've, I've preached from this p particular portion of Scripture. Uh, but I do believe that God's given me some new revelations, some new understanding on some things here today. So if you can turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. And I'm going to trust them to get it up on the screen. Starting in verse 13, it says, you are the salt of the earth. Okay, this is right after he said, blessed are those who mourn. Uh, and he goes through all the, these beatitudes, right? And then all of a sudden he says, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus is always kind of flipping the script. Like every time you think you know where he's going, all of a sudden he just kind of diverts and goes somewhere else and starts talking about something else. What in the world does, be, does uh, being persecuted and, and, and being, uh, being mournful and all these things have to do with salt of the earth? Many of you may have heard of, of people saying, oh, well, they're just kind of salt of the earth people. You know, just kind of average, kind of ordinary. They add some flavor into some things. But, but we're going to get into this a little bit more. And it says, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. He gave us an instruction. This wasn't the disciples that he was talking to. This was anyone that came to, came to that, that, that message that day, came to that sermon today. And he said, look, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are to be the light set on a, or you're to be a lamp set on a hill for everyone to see. He was telling them, this is what happens after I go away. You're, you are the salt of the earth. What is salt used for? Today, we pretty much just kind of know it as, you know, for flavor. But in the day, the, the, back in the Old Testament, they even had a thing called a salt covenant. And that's, uh, you know, whenever you, uh, a lot of times whenever you would trade property or, or, or different things that you would bring some of your salt and, and whoever you're making the deal with would bring some of their salt and you'd both pour them into a container. And that covenant meant that whenever you can finally go through there and separate your salt away from my salt, then the covenant's over. But until then, we are bound together in covenant. And, and so that was a salt covenant and, and salt was uh, some trade. It was of some value because then... Salt was used to preserve. It was used to preserve things. It was used to purify things. It, much different than the way we do some processes today. And, and today we don't even really think about it a lot of times. And, but here I want you to realize that when Jesus is talking, he's saying, look, you are the salt. You are the solution to this world. What you've received from me, now you are the salt. You're the thing that's going to add flavor in this world. When people look at you, you're, there should be something so flavorful about you that it causes people to want it. I don't know about you. I don't know how many of you are, are uh, affected by what you see. But I could not be hungry at all. That doesn't hardly ever happen. But you cannot be, I cannot be hungry at all. And I'll watch a commercial. I'm like, we got to go to Dairy Queen or whatever it might be, you know, like I can literally just get done with dinner and a dessert and everything else. And we'll sit down on the couch to watch some TV. And all of a sudden they'll throw up an Applebee's commercial or a Texas Roadhouse or whatever it is. I'm like, huh, it's time to go eat. I am motivated by what I see. Think about this. Are people looking at your life thinking, hmm, 
I need to figure out why they're so different. What is it about them that they are happy, that they're joyful, that, that things are working out for them? What is going on in their life? Are you living a salty life? See, we are the salt solution. We are the salt solution. We are the solution for the world, not because of anything that we've done, but because we have been made righteous by Christ. And it's only in Christ, the, the Savior of the world, that we can offer anything. And if anyone else is hot in here today, it's not just me. One of our air conditioners went down, so I apologize. I don't want to hear anyone saying they're cold today. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to move on here a little bit because as I was looking at this thing, he compares salt and light, you know, two things that don't seem like they have anything to do together. I mean, if you said salt and pepper, like, oh, okay, I get it. No, no, salt and light. Light, what is light? And, it, and when we think about light, the, the term that it literally meant well, in, the, in the literal sense was literally like a torch or a, an oil-filled lamp. Anybody have the old oil-filled lamps that they used to use with the wick and you had to put the oil in and, and, the, and the little lantern? And so that's what it was referring to. You know, there was a process to that thing. It wasn't just something that happened. There was a process to it. And he was saying, look, you don't go through the process of lighting a lamp and then cover it up. No, you light it so that you can see in the darkness. And I, I don't know if this is true, if I can remember back into high school or college, but if I remember correctly, you guys don't correct me now, but you can contact me later or online if you want to email me or whatever. But I, if, I, if I understand correctly, darkness does not have the ability to multiply itself. True darkness is literally just the absence of light. So once you remove all the light, darkness is as dark as it can get. It can't get any darker. But light is inf infinite. It can only continue to get brighter. We've only lost, we, we lose the ability, ability to measure the intensity of light. And so when I think about this thing, when he's telling us to be light set upon a hill for, for, the, for the, or a city set upon a hill for the world to see, I think about that. And if we're not careful, what happens is we look at our world and everything that's happening in it, and we, we almost get overwhelmed because it almost, if we're not careful, looks like it's, it's, it's without hope, like it's lost. It's so far gone. I don't even know if God can do anything else. But I want to, I want to encourage you with this today that darkness can never overpower light. Darkness never overpowers. And I've made a statement here before, and I need to correct myself because I said the church, the church is in trouble. And what I meant was the, the church that we've got comfortable with, the church that we've known today, not this building, but the modern-day church is in trouble, but not the church, not the ecclesia. Because Jesus said, upon this rock will I build my church. See, man doesn't build the church. God does. And I want us to come to the understanding that, look, I don't care how gross the darkness grows, as Scripture says, grace will much more abound. The light of the hope of Jesus Christ will continue to abound and will continue to grow. The, the problem is the reason the world keeps growing darker, darker is not because there's more darkness in the world. It's because there's less light. That should be a charge for us as Christians today. That should be a charge for those of us that, that call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, those that call ourselves saved, because Jesus gave us this. And he said, look, you need to be salt and light in the world that you're in. Maybe not in the entire world, but if you think about the world that you operate in, you can break it all the way down to your own home. Do you have some darkness in your home? Don't look at them. <laughs> Think about it, though. Think about your own families, not just in, in your own, in your own uh, dwelling place, but maybe you've got some darkness in your family. Maybe there's some things that have overwhelmed your family, and you, you, you've kind of been known as a family that does this. You've got some things that are not uh, God-honoring, things that you're not proud of. Do we continue to magnify those things, or do we continue to speak the light of Jesus Christ over them? See, we, we, we made a statement even in my own family the other day. There was something that kind of happened, and it, it wasn't a, a, a positive thing. It was kind of one of those things, and we're like, well, I didn't expect anything better or anything different. Like, we had already set ourselves up for expecting a bad thing because it's just, oh, well, that's just what happens for the Greenwoods. Or that's just what ha How many of you do the same thing? But yet the Bible says 
that we're, that we're a chosen people, that we're above and not beneath. And, and I think about this. How many of us identify with what the world has titled us instead of what God has called us? See, the truth is we can't be salt and light unless we believe it. We can't really be everything that God has, has called us to be, and we can't operate. Even though the anointing is there, even though he's, he said this is what will happen, if we don't believe it and begin to operate in it, it won't happen. See, it doesn't mean that there's not enough anointing there. It doesn't mean that God's not there. It just means that we haven't lined ourselves up with it. And so we have that responsibility. It's, it's up to us to join in with what God says. And am I following in that? And as I do those things... As I line myself up, then all of a sudden I will be salt, I will be light. Because he was it first. I think about this because he says, I am the light of the world. But then he turns around and tells us that you are the light. He wasn't just the light for those that were, that were around Jesus that day when he was giving the sermon. It wasn't just that he was saying, you, you disciples that are going to follow after me, you guys are going to be the light of the world and you're going to turn things upside down. No, it was anyone who believes in me and follows after me, you are the light of the world. When you accept me into your life, you become light. We become reflections of Jesus Christ. I heard a pastor say this, that the more we look at Christ, the more we become like Christ. And I begin to think about that because I wonder what would happen if more and more of us begin to look more and more to Christ. And we wonder why there's so many things that are, that are going in bad directions. I want you to turn in 2 Kings. I'm going to try and tie a couple things together because I said a, long, a, a year or two ago, I can't remember what it was. I think part of the problem that we have in our world today is that the church has not been who we were called to be. That we haven't done what we were supposed to do. And that's not a great feel-good message. That's not like, ooh, let me come back next week and find out what else I screwed up. <laughs> right? No one wants to hear that. Uh, but I was thinking about these things, and I, I don't mean this to be a, a letdown, but I want it to be a charge. I'm one of those people that if I do something wrong, I may not like what you have to tell me about what I did wrong, but I want it. Because if I don't know what I'm doing wrong, I can't fix it. And, and uh, Jenny will probably attest to this a lot. She's like, you liar. You never like anything I have to say to you when you, when you do things wrong. And that's because I just don't do anything wrong anymore. <laughs> I mean, at almost 53 years old, I finally kind of perfected this thing. Just kidding. Uh, I'm still learning. Uh, I'm an old dog and, and still in process trying to learn some new tricks. But as we turn into this second Kings, uh, we see something happening here. And, and I've heard this in the last couple of years. And I've even said it myself that I'm a little bit concerned in the transition that I've seen in the church world, not meaning, uh, as far as what I've seen actually happening with the churches, but what I've seen in transition of what we would call generals of the faith. We have seen a lot of, and maybe it's because of the sphere that, that, I, that I'm associated with, I'm a little bit more aware of it, but we have lost some major, major generals of the faith, of the Christian faith. Churches are going through major transition of ministers and, and godly men and women that have been sold out and given their life for the kingdom for 20, 30, 40 years, and now they're, they're gone, they're passing away. And if we're not careful, what happens is we get scared because we're like, oh no, this is the only reason we were able to operate the way we were operating is because they were here. See, if we're not careful, we begin to, even though we, we don't intend to, we, we have a tendency to, to put our eyes on man. And when, when we see those things begin to fall, those, those people that we've, we've accidentally set up on pedestals, I, I, I don't really think I know anyone personally that idolizes a T.D. Jakes or a Joel Olstein or a Stephen Furtick or any of these major, major uh, Christian people. I don't think I know anyone personally that says, oh, they have all wisdom, all truth, and they, they hear straight from heaven. I don't think I know anybody like that. I know there's a lot of people that follow them. I know a lot of people that listen to them, and they, and they will choose some of, them, uh, some of their teachings over other teachings, and, and everyone has their favorites. But I don't think I know anyone that, that idolizes them, but in, in, in reality, if, we're not, if we really look at it, we do begin to elevate some certain people. I've seen it happen so many times in this church over the years. 
I would watch uh, an altar call happen for certain things, and I would watch altar workers come up here to, that had been, had been blessed and anointed by the leadership of this church, but everyone would line up under one person because they, they thought that person was the one that could bring healing. Okay. <clears throat> but anyway, and see if we're not careful... We think that all of a sudden God can't, there's no prophetic voice left in the church. We think there's no apostle left in the church. We think there's no anointing left in the church because that person's gone. Isn't that exactly what they did with Elijah? Second Kings, this is the transition of Elijah. Many of you may have heard him, of him before. He was the prophet for, for Israel. And he did many wonderful uh, things. He, did, he had some amazing miracles and things that, that, that people still talk about today. I've preached multiple messages uh, from Elijah and the things that happened that, that he saw God do through prayer. We talked about it, the 63-word prayer that brought fire down from heaven and consumed an altar. And, and he was able to, to overthrow the, the false teachers and of the time, and, and we see those things, those false prophets, and, and if we're not careful, though, we look to them, and this is what happens here in, in 2 Kings chapter 2. Elijah's gone. It says that a whirlwind came, and a, and a chariot of fire came down, and Elijah went up into heaven, and, and, and they, they said right after this, they said, we'll send 50 men to go look for him, and Elisha says, no, don't. He's gone. But if you read through it, it says that they persuaded him so much that they begged him so badly because they needed Elijah because Elijah was the one that, that was doing some things. Elijah conquered Ahab and, and put Jezebel in her place and all these things begin to happen and oh no, Elijah's gone, what are we going to do now? The anointing of God has left us, the man of God has left us. But Elisha says don't do it and he finally gives in because they were pressuring him so much so for three days... 50 men went to look for him, and they came back and said, we can't find him. And Elisha said, I told you not to go looking. <laughs> I mean, that's basically what he says. You know, you didn't listen to me. But here's, here's where we pick this story up in, Eli in 2 Kings chapter 2. This is one of the, the miracles that amazes me because Elisha, for those of you that might not know, Elisha was the protege. Elisha was mentored by Elijah. Elisha followed Elijah for several years, and he was his servant. And he got to the place where Elisha said, I, I, want, I want the mantle that you have, but I don't want just the mantle that you have, the anointing that you have. I want double that. I want, I want God to do so much more for his people to reveal himself. And Elijah says, you've asked a hard thing. But he finally says, if you're there the day that I'm taken away, then, then that, so be it. And so this is where we pick this up. I'm sorry, I keep telling you to put it up there and then... It goes off. It says, one day the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. We have a problem, my lord, they told him. This town is located in pleasant surroundings, as you can see. But the water is bad, and the land is unproductive. Elisha said, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring that supplied the town with water and threw the salt into it. And he said, this is what the Lord says. I have purified this water. It will no longer cause death or infertility. And the water has remained pure ever since, just as Elisha has said. I want to I tie this thing in here a little bit because <clears throat> there's so many things in here. And I'm going I'm to just try to go off of, of uh, my studies without getting into my notes. But the town Jericho was beautiful. He said, we live in these pleasant surroundings. Everything about it looked like, man, we need to go to Jericho. At this track meet that we were at the other day, they had a brand new school, brand new uh, softball, baseball, soccer fields, brand new sports stadium. The sound system was incredible. And we were looking at all these things, and this guy came over and talked to me. And all of a sudden, he started talking about how awesome this community is. And, man, you should move here. Like, didn't know me from Adam. I had no clue who he was. I don't even know where he came from. I literally came out of the bathroom hobbling, and this guy's standing there. He says, isn't this place wonderful? And I was like, yeah. I said, it's the first time I've ever been here. It looks pretty cool. He said, and he begins to tell me how many millions of dollars they spent, and I don't know where they got the money. And like, he's just going on and on and on. And he's like, you should bring, your, he saw my son do some stuff, and he said, you should bring your son and your family here. This is an awesome community to belong to. 
I was like, okay. Like, <laughs> like are you going to get like a fee off this? Like, are you a realtor? Are you trying to sell me a home? What's happening here? And he was like, if you weren't, if you weren't in that boot, he said, I'd take you around and show you everything, but I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to wear you out. And I was like, well, thank you. <laughs> like, thank you, boot. Nice job. <laughs> Got me out of that one. You know, but I was sitting there and I was, I was thinking about it. This is the same thing that these men were doing. They're like, look at our town, Elisha. Look at our city. It's beautiful. Look at all the lush trees or whatever it was. Look at our beautiful buildings or look at how, how friendly everybody is. All these things. He said, but we've got a problem. And the problem was the water. The source. You can't live without water. And see, the problem is, and we think about it, we just went through some of the stuff in our country with Flint, Michigan, and, and, their, and their contaminated water source, and we found out that it's the pipes and all these different things, and all this stuff has to happen. And, but think about this. Do, if you lived in a town that had a major life source problem, would you go around talking good about it? I'm not trying to be, be negative on Decatur, but I don't hear very many people talking Decatur up. Most of the time I hear people talking about how bad the city is, the taxes are out of control, violence is out of control, racism's out of control, our government's corrupt, housing may be low, but man, you, want, you don't want to get stuck here. Get your kids out of this area, move, on the, move to the outskirts, move different states. I don't know, maybe I'm just in a weird group, but I don't hear a whole lot of people saying, come to Decatur, it's the place to be. <laughs> I've often referred to it as the second armpit of Illinois. <laughs> and begin to challenge me with this message, with this, these verses. Because I like Decatur. I don't know why. I've tried many, many times to get away. We've, we had offers in Tennessee. We had offers, to, uh, Jenny and I had offers to, to go to Oklahoma to minister with another guy and take over his youth ministry. And for whatever reason, God never released us. And you start complaining about it. It's like, why am I stuck in the armpit of Illinois? And it's finally beginning to come to me because I have an assignment. Just like Elisha had an assignment for Jericho. See, what, what happens is too many times we can look at that and say, well, well, why did Elijah leave it that way? I mean, Elijah was the one that came in and, and began to turn everything around. Elijah was the one that held the rain back. Elijah was the one that did this and this and this and this. See, what happens is if we're not careful, we will we'll live in the problem and blame the generation that was before us. But yet the whole time, we have the solution. We have the salt solution. We're called to be the salt of the earth. We're called to be the thing that purifies and cleanses and, and, and to be the thing that preserves an area. We're called to be the light in the darkness. And so I'm believing that God has got us on assignment here because I believe that God's getting ready to do something through this crazy little town. I believe that God is getting ready to bust forth in such a way that if he can find just enough people that will be salt and just enough people that will be light, light will overrun the darkness in this city. Light will overrun racism. Light will overrun corruption and, and crime. Oh, I don't know if i got a church that believes any of that. See, because we've lived in it for so long, what good can come out of Decatur, Illinois? I'm telling you, if there's one person here that believes in Jesus Christ and believes that there's a God that sits in heaven and says, I can do anything, I can make all things new, then God can change Decatur, Illinois. God can change Macon County. The question is, will we believe it? He said that we're to be the salt and we're to be the light, but yet the, the, the disciples went and hid. They were scared to death. Now, I know that Jesus told them to go to the upper room, but you've got to remember, they're fearful. Their leader just got crucified in a manner that had never been done before. Not that the crucifixion hadn't been done before, but the beating and the scourging and everything else that happened to him up until that point had not happened to that level of intensity before, and they watched that. They were a part of that. They witnessed it. Just like many of you have witnessed the corruption in your family or the corruption in our city and state, and we've seen the, the evil that begins to happen, and we begin to think, oh no, maybe God can't do anything. Maybe this place really is cursed. 
But I'm telling you, if we will grab a hold of what God said and believe that he is the light in us that can transform the darkness, then something will begin to change. And so as we do these things, I want to I bring out a few more points in this, in this message here today, out of these verses, because Elisha, it wasn't that Elijah didn't do everything. See, Jesus is the only one that said, it is finished, right? He's the only one that's ever lived that accomplished everything that was set for him to do. And Elisha followed up with where Elijah left off. See, we don't need to be fearful that, that all of our good men and women have died off or, or maybe they've transitioned and moved to different states and cities because God will always leave a remnant. God will never leave a people uh, in a void. He will never let it go to a place where his word won't come forth. There will be somebody there will be somebody, someone that will step up and the gospel will begin to grow again. It may be in a horrible, horrible state, but there will always be someone because that's God's word. See, do we truly believe what his word says? Too many times I, I get frustrated with myself because I preach messages like this and I'm like, Dad, Gummit, I've cursed everything about Decatur. I've said God can't do anything with it. And you put a message like this in my heart and I've got to stand up there and preach it against myself. <laughs> Because I'm like, God, why don't you send me somewhere else that I like? <laughs> I do like Decatur. Don't get me wrong. I do, I do like it. I love the people of the city. But there are a lot of other places that look really, really nice. But look at Jericho. He said, look, we got it all. But our water is bad. Our source of life is bad. I love this because it says that, that uh, their, their fields were barren, and at the end of that, it says the infertility. There was lots of, of, of childbirth that wasn't coming to full term because the water was bad. See, the enemy, if the enemy can, can stop the seed from producing to coming to full maturity, all of a sudden there, can't, there, can't, there won't be any growth, there won't be any new things coming out of it, and all of a sudden he's taken over that area. That's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about standing against abortion. It's not that I don't understand some of the rights. It's not that I don't feel for, for some of the situations. But I truly believe that God is the one that grants life. And therefore, no matter what the situation is, is if life came into that, into that, be, into that body, then God has a plan and a purpose for it. Right. Anyway, let me move on. I, I need to wrap this thing up. As I think about this, I'm looking at it, and, and Elisha does something strange here. If you can throw that scripture back up, throw it up in the King James for me, please. I think it's verse 20 that I, that I want to read. See, because what we would do today, a lot of us would have the tendency that, that maybe if, if, we, if we had the boldness of Elisha, that we would probably go to the mayor, we'd probably go to the city, city manager, we may go to some of the, 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 the big CEOs in the city and say, hey, you know, you need to come up with some programs to fix the problems in this city. I mean, we've got, we've got buildings that are empty everywhere, you know, and that's just, that's just breeding all kinds of crime and everything else. You need to do something about this city. But what does Elisha do? He asks, uh, is verse 20 in the King James, I think it is. Bring me a new cruise. I had to look that up because I didn't know what a new cruise was. I was thinking like a, a GT500 or something like that, you know. And uh, bring me a new cruise. And it literally means a bowl or a jar. It's just a vessel, right? But he said, bring me a new cruise and then put some salt in there or therein. He didn't go to anything, in, no man-made thing. He didn't go to the government. He didn't go to any, anybody that was in charge of anything. He went directly to the source of the problem. And I think as Christians, too many times that we focus our attention on things that aren't the source, they're just part of the problem. They may be the thing that's visible. I don't know about you, but I've, I've had a lot of splinters in my day. And every once in a while, if you don't know you've got a splinter, it begins to fester and it begins, to, begins to get infected. And all of a sudden, you're looking at it and you're like, how? What in the world is that? And you begin to rub it and do all these things. And then all of a sudden, you'll, you'll see the splinter or whatever come out. See, the, 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 the infection wasn't the problem. It was what was inside of it that was causing the problem. And, and that's what happens for us a lot of times as Christians is, is we see that we don't like some things that are happening in our school, so we'll attack the school board. 
or we see some things that are happening in our company and we'll, we'll go to HR. But how many of you know that, that everything evil doesn't just come from people? There's a source to the evil. The Bible says that we've got to take the strong man of the city. And until the church begins to understand who she is, we will continue going around the same mountain and we'll continue to battle some of the same problems. We'll just keep going after the little things instead of attacking the, the bigger source. But Elisha says, bring me a new, a new cruise or a new jar or a new bowl and put some salt in it. And he brought it and, and we, re we read the rest of that. It says that he went to the source and it says, and the Lord says, this is what happens from this day forward. It's, it's going to be cleansed. I love this idea because that word, when I looked it up, it was literally only mentioned one time in the entire Old, New, uh, in the entire Old Testament. That word cruise, excuse me. That word cruise was only mentioned one time in the entire Old Testament. And that caught my attention. I'm like, what's so special about a jar or a bowl or whatever that it's only used this one time, the way that it's used? Because he said he wanted a new one. He didn't want, want one that had been used before. He didn't want one that maybe had some residue of the bad water in it. He didn't want one that had been contaminated. And see, if we're not careful, the Bible says that, that, in the, that he's going to pour out his spirit in the last days. And the Bible tells us that, that you don't put new wine in an old wineskin. You have to put new wine in a new wineskin. And if we continue to keep taking what God is pouring out and putting it in the traditions of the past or in the religions that we've set up or the ideas that we've set up in our mind, it will, it will always be contaminated. Every time I get ready to preach, I ask God to help me to not say anything out of my flesh, but let me only say what comes from his heart. Because I don't know about you, but, but I can go off on a tangent. It doesn't take much. It really doesn't take much at all for me to, to get bent out of sort. And I can respond to some things and think that I'm being holy and justified because I, I made new in Christ. But it's filtered through my own mindset, my own ideas, my own heart issues. And so I ask God to help me in these things because I don't want to come against things in my flesh. I want to come against things in the spirit. I want to challenge you in the spirit. I'm not saying that anyone in here is doing anything wrong, but I am challenging you. Are you doing everything he's asked you to do? Are you being salt in your world? Are you being light in your world? That's a charge to us. See, he told his disciples way before he was ever crucified you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You're the thing that's here to lead people to me. You're the one that's here to purify what's left. And so often what happens in the modern world is we only worry about our salvation or we only worry about our, where our family's at, but yet we leave the rest of the world cursed and damned and going to hell in a handbasket because we don't want to share our salt and we don't want to spread the light. See, in Isaiah chapter 43, he says, Behold, I do a new thing. Elisha came and did something that Elijah didn't do. He did it a different way than Elijah did. Some of you have come from different churches. I probably pe preach a little bit different than things you've heard before. Some of you that have grown up in this church or you've been here when Pastor Jack preached, I preach a whole lot different than Dad did. But it doesn't mean that the Spirit of God isn't still moving. It may be a new vessel, but the same spirit still runs through this church. And that's what we always want to be. Whether it's a worship leader that changes, whether it's a sound tech that changes, we want the spirit of God to run through this place. And we're just the vessels that are trying to glorify him and honor him. And I begin to think about these things because, see, it wasn't, it wasn't evil people. Well, it was evil people, but let me rephrase that a little bit. See, if Jesus came to the church today... It wasn't all the people in the bar down the street that crucified him. It was the people in the church that crucified him. Because we hold on to our traditions, we hold on to the things that we value without running them through Scripture, without running them through the, the heart of God. And I want us to get to that place today where we truly are salty, where we truly are the light of the world. Is everything that I'm doing, is it bringing glory and honor to Christ? See, if you go back to Matthew and read through the end of it, you don't have to go there. But if you read through that, that scripture, at the end of it, it says, let all of your good deeds, let it point back to Christ. Is everything we do to glorify God, or are we still trying to build our own kingdoms? Are we still trying to build our own little Jerichos? 
And so this, this word was challenging to me today because I believe that too often what happens is we've become like the disciples. We know what Jesus said. We've experienced Jesus. We walk through all the different transformational things that he's done. But then all of a sudden we get into a situation and it doesn't look like he's there anymore. It looks like he's left us. And then we're left in fear and trembling. But we forget all the things that he said to us along the way. So often what happens in churches today is we get offended by what one person did but forget everything that Christ did for us. And we've got people, people in the world today that are leaving the, the, the faith over what someone did. Not because Christ failed them, not because God didn't answer their prayer, but because brother or sister so-and-so looked at them wrong. Well, if that's a Christian, I don't want anything to do it. But... On the flip side of that, that's our responsibility. Are we glorifying Christ in everything we say, everything that we do, every good deed, every action? Is it to glorify Christ? See, when we put that first, all of a sudden it begins to change some of our motives. It begins to change our perspective on some things. I'm going to bring this to a close if you'll stand with me. In John, in the book of John, he goes, he goes through seven statements that Jesus makes. They're the seven I am's. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he finally says, I am the light of the world. But then he turns around and tells us, you are the light of the world. Today, will you be challenged with this message of being salty and being light? The word, when, he, when he talks about us being the light, it's the only time that he, he allows us to join with him in identity in that area. He doesn't tell us that we're the, we are the bread of life. He doesn't tell us that we are the vine. He doesn't tell us that, that we are the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't tell us that, that, that we are the resurrection and the life. He tells us you are the light, the same way that he is the light. We, we do everything that we can to bring glory and honor to God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this day. I thank you for every person that is here. Father, I pray that every word that I spoke today, that it wouldn't be uh, received in a harsh manner, but Father, that it would be received as, as a challenge, not as a challenge of, of, of something that, that we need to fight for, but Lord, help it to be something that we look at and reflect on and say, God, forgive me in this area because I wasn't being light or I haven't been salty in this area. God, forgive me because I haven't stood on your word. I haven't believed your promises. I've fallen back into some areas of, of, of what I identify with. I'm not identifying with who you've called me to be. I'm identifying with what the world has called me to be. Father, I pray that today, if there's anyone here that, is, that has not started their relationship with you, they may have heard of you, they may have known you, maybe their family has known you forever, but they themselves have never personally started that relationship with you father today don't let them leave this place without starting that journey if there's anyone here today that needs prayer for anything we have uh, prayer workers altar workers as jenny said earlier that will join their faith with your faith and believe god for great things the word says that if any two touching anything on earth agreeing that it shall be done in heaven will be done here on earth and that's what we're believing for we're believing that today that there's power and unity that there's power in combined faith Lord, I'm asking that today you would touch your people, you would challenge us and change us. Don't let us leave this place the same way that we came in. In Jesus' name, amen.